All right, happy Thursday to you. Um, oh, I showed this already for our in-class people, but test is in two weeks, quiz is in one week, um, so just don't let that sneak up on you. Pep rally's tomorrow, so make sure you wear your Hawaiian gear, uh, even if you're at home or you go to a different school. Participate in the KHS pep rally situation. All right, I'm going to call this Unit 1 Day 1, even though it's not really Day 1, but that will make it match um, two things. It will make... It will make it will match my notes from previous years, so that's convenient for me. More importantly, it will match um, the worksheet packet that I'm going to give you, because today's worksheet is worksheet one. So let's call today day one, and that will match with worksheet one. And that way, um, later on, if you're stuck on worksheet three, then you know where to go look. That would be on day three. So try to keep things organized. So functions. This is. A kind of a continuation from yesterday. So yesterday we looked at what one was um, and wasn't and spent the whole day talking about vending machines and vertical line tests and, and all that stuff. Today we're going to jump in a little bit deeper and do a couple things with functions. First thing we'll do is evaluate. And By the way, this is one of those days where it's almost completely Algebra 2 and then maybe at the end maybe it's a little bit new. And that's a lot of what pre-cal first semester is, is um, sharpening up our algebra skills and then taking them a little bit further. So if you did great in algebra two, then most of the semester will be easy, is probably not the right word, but familiar at least to you. Hopefully it's familiar to everybody. All right, just as an example function, let's take f of t and set it equal to or define it to be, would be a better way to say that, f of t is t squared minus 3t. Now, I'm going to guess and hope that you remember this is just a way to say where the t goes, or whatever's in parentheses goes in for t on the other side. I think this is old news to you, but I'll I try to teach it from scratch. That way, if you forgot it or if something happened, then you still be able to, to keep up. So f of 2 means plug 2 in on the other side. <clears throat> so wherever there was a t, goes a 2. Wherever there was a t, goes a 2. So now we can evaluate 4 minus 6 equals negative 2. What's kind of fun and something to look forward to is when you get to calculus, they assume you know how to do the easy stuff. So in calculus, we have things called safe stops where you don't have to evaluate. You plug it in and you'd be done right here. So that, that's something that's a year away for you guys. But in calculus, we don't actually have to do all the easy math. We stop there and say, eh, you can figure it out if you need to. But we're not in calculus, so we need to go ahead and, and figure them out the whole way. All right, this next one is going to really um, confuse some people. And it's not my goal to confuse, but it happens. F of orange triangle. Any idea what in the world we're supposed to do with f of orange triangle? Whatever's in parentheses goes in for t on the other side. So orange triangle squared minus 3 times orange triangle. And there, I mean, there's nothing more we can do with that. But that's to help illustrate that whatever's in parentheses, whether it's a 2 or a 7, or negative pi, or an orange triangle, doesn't matter what it is, it goes in on the other side for t. Now, that's supposed to help us when we get things like f of x minus 2. So it's not just a number, or a letter, or a shape, it's like this chunk of stuff. But same thing, whatever's in parentheses goes in for t on the other side. two or a triangle or x minus two, plug it in on the other side. 
Now we've got a little bit of cleanup over here on the right to do. X minus 2 squared. Um, hopefully we know we can't just square the pieces. Um, we would need to foil that. I'm going to assume you can foil without writing it out. But if you need to write it out, that's okay. Since it's the first time, here's the reminder. The first would be x times x is x squared. The outside would be negative 2x. The inside would be negative 2x combined for negative 4x. And then the last would be plus 4. And then distribute the minus 3. Yeah, that's a scribble right in front for trying to figure out what that is. And then now it's just collect like terms. So x squared, I don't have any other x squareds. 4x, so minus 4x, minus 3x would be minus 7x, and then plus 4 and plus 6 would be plus 10. Maybe overkill with identifying the like terms there, but better safe than sorry. Oops, number Example 4, f of x minus f of 2. So first notice how that's different than number 3. Number 3 was f of x minus 2. This one is f of x minus f of 2. Well, f of x would be x squared minus 3x. Minus f of 2. We already found f of 2, so we don't need to, read, we don't need to do that again. That's from up above. It was negative 2. So x squared minus 3x minus negative 2. Well, of course, the minus negative becomes plus. So 3 and 4 look alike, but they're different. So we need to be careful and keep up with, with what's what. So that's plugging things in, evaluating functions at various numbers or symbols or colored shapes. Roman numeral 2, 2 of 3, by the way, in case you're in head, is domain. What, what do you remember about domain? Oh, surely you remember something. I wouldn't say axis, but otherwise, yes. Domain is the x values, yeah. and range is the y values that it covers. the possible x values, or the inputs. And on the graph, it's like, well, how far left and right does it go? Because that would be domain. That would be the x values. There's only, for us, I guess you should be careful how I phrase this, there's only three things that we're going to have to worry about when it comes to domain. The further you go in math, the more things we'd have to add to this list. But for us, we're going to stick to three things that we need to be concerned with. First is square roots. So let's say f of x equals the square root of 2x plus 6. Um, what do you, what can't you take the square root of? What doesn't work when you try to square root it? At least with the real numbers. I mean, you could do them, but then you get imaginary numbers. We don't want to do that yet. Negatives. You can't square root a negative number. At least if I want to stay away from the imaginary stuff. So that's sort of what we start with. Can't square root a negative. So that rule we know, let's sort of translate that rule that we know into some math stuff here. That would mean that whatever this is, so 2x plus 6, if I want to be able to square root it, has to be greater than 0 because it can't be negative. 
Now, what about equal to zero? Let's think about that. Can I square root zero? It would just be zero. So I can equal zero. So greater than or equal to zero. So the rule for square roots is that the inside, what's inside the house, has to be greater than or equal to zero. That's our square root rule. Whatever's inside the house has to be greater than or equal to zero. Now we don't stop there. That's like the starting point. So let's solve this thing. 2x greater than or equal to negative 6. x is greater than or equal to negative 3. And we want to put that in interval notation. Do you remember what interval notation means? <laughs> some yes, some no. What do you remember about interval notation, those that said yes? What's, what's one of the key things to, to think about when we do interval notation? OK, domain and range, they do go together. Um, open circles versus closed circles, parentheses versus brackets. Um, does that sound familiar? Which one means in to include? Which one is equal to? The, no, the brackets. The brackets. I, my remembering is the brackets hold more. Like if you try to put water in those like sideways, the brackets hold more stuff. So they would hold the equals. Um, the parentheses would exclude the equals. So if we want x to be greater than or equal to 3, uh, I'm going to do a little intermediate step that you don't have to do, but it might help. And that's put it on a number line. Closed circle, greater than or equal to negative 3. Again, you don't have to do that step. Some of you will, will bypass that step, which is fine. So the interval for that would be from negative 3 to infinity. The bracket on negative 3, because we want to include it. So the equal sign and the bracket and the closed circle all mean include the negative 3 equal to negative 3. We're OK with negative 3 as part of the answer. So domain would be from negative 3 to infinity. All right, so that's the first rule. Fractions, or excuse me, square roots have to be greater than or equal to 0. Give me the second rule, or the second topic, fractions. And this is another game or another topic where we're more concerned about what it can't be than what it can be. So you, you can't square root a negative number. With fractions, uh, what can't you have? What do you have to be concerned with? What doesn't work when it comes to fractions? Some people remember it this way. Does that make, have you seen that before? Oh, so one yes, uh, two no's. If the denominator is zero, then it doesn't, it's not an actual number. Right, if the denominator is zero, that's a no. You can't do that. So no means can't divide by zero. Students sometimes get them, get them backwards. Like, where, where is it OK for a zero to be? Where can't it be? Well, OK and no. Zero in the top is OK. That just equals zero. Zero in the bottom, you can't do. Denominator can't be zero. Um, let's back up and explain that, because some people get stuck there. So if all you do is memorize OK and no, that's fine. But that doesn't really explain what's going on. Think about what division is. Think about. Um, back in elementary school when you first learned it and your, your teacher gave you eight M&Ms and you had four members in your group and everybody got two M&Ms because eight divided by four is two. That's how you first learned division. If your teacher gave, and maybe they did, I wish they would do this, maybe it sounds cruel, if they gave your group of four zero M&Ms, they gave your group of four, so you had four students, 
and your group had zero M&Ms, how many M&Ms would each student get? Zero. So you can divide, you can start with zero in the top, zero divided by four, everybody gets zero M&Ms. Now let's do it the other way. If we've got a group, uh, so we've got our four desks, but nobody's sitting there, so there's zero people in the group, how do I divide up four M&Ms among zero people? You can't. That doesn't make sense. You can't You can't do that. You're just stuck with your four M&Ms. There's no people to divide it up with. You can't divide by zero. So if you remember OK and no, that's fine. But I'd rather you have an understanding of why it doesn't work, because uh, I think that would stick with you longer than OK and no. So let's do an example with a fraction. What? Let's get let's get even fancier than the example I had written down here. Make up a factoring problem on the fly. Dangerous. Spooky. Factoring in general is spooky. Then try to make one up on the fly. So f of x equals 3x plus 2 over x squared plus 7x plus 12. And the instructions would be find the domain. The domain would be the bottom can't be zero, like just big picture. We don't care what the top is, but the bottom can't be zero. x squared plus 7x plus 12 can't have that equal to zero. Well, let's factor it. Here we'll see if I made up the factoring problem correctly. That's a pretty easy one. So I was able to make it up in my head. 4 and 3 make 12, and 4 added to 3 is 7. So negative 4 and negative 3. Now we have to be careful. The domain is not negative 4 and negative 3. What is it? Negative 4 and negative 3 make the bottom 0. So it's everything except those. So this is, this is if I leave this as my answer, I mean, I'm not going to take off all the points, but I'm, I'd be tempted to because that is exactly wrong. Like It's everything except negative 4 and negative 3. I still want that in interval notation, though. So I'm going to... Again, number line it. Number line is, is optional. It, it helps me visualize. It's, it may help some of you visualize how to write the interval. So this is a little bit weird. I can't have negative 4 and I can't have negative 3, but I can have everything else. Do you want to take a stab at it? That's where you use the U. Yes. It's where I'd use the, the U because there's multiple regions to include. So. I read it left to right, just like I read graphs and I read books left to right. The answers start at negative infinity and go to negative 4. Parentheses or bracket for negative 4? Parentheses. Parentheses, like the whole point is to exclude negative 4. I don't want negative 4. And then the U. And then here's the piece that some people leave out. Like they'll, they know to go negative 3 to an to infinity, but they leave out the middle piece, negative 4 to negative 3, and then negative 3 to infinity. Now, usually, interval notation is, is cleaner and neater than any other form. This would be kind of the exception. It would be easier to just say x can't be negative 4 and x can't be negative 3. So I'll grant you that on this one it would be easier, but we still want to be in the habit of using interval notation. So this is one where this is going to get you most of the points on the test, but if you don't put it in interval notation, you're going to lose a point or two because that's the format that we want. But big picture, fractions can't divide by zero. And then we got into some details, but fractions can't divide by zero. So square roots have to be greater than or equal to zero. Fractions can't divide by zero. And then lastly, and this is the easy one, but it throws people off because it's easy. 
polynomials. So something like 3x cubed minus 5x plus 7. Or another example, uh, 2x minus 5 all over 3. Those are polynomials. They don't have any square roots. They don't have any, be careful how we say this, there is a fraction there. But the 3 is never going to be 0, so I'm never going to be dividing by 0, so I don't have to worry about that. So there's no limits on what, or no restrictions on what we could plug in. This works for anything. I can plug in whatever number I want. Negative 3, negative 5 million, 0 0.001. I can plug in anything I want. So the domain is all real numbers and an interval notation negative infinity to infinity. So it's, polynomials are the easiest one, but they trick people because people start trying to do something with it, especially if we give you one that factors. Like if I give you x squared minus 1, some students are like, aha, I can factor that, x plus 1, x minus 1. Like, yeah, but that doesn't matter for domain. So. It's the easiest one, but in some ways it's the most missed one because you're trying to do something with it. Well, what's, is it greater than zero? It can't be zero. No, none of that. It can be whatever you want, all real numbers. All right, last thing, and this may be the new thing. Maybe not. It's called the difference quotient. Sounds fancy. This is this is sort of the pre-calculus part of pre-calculus because the difference quotient we use a lot in calculus. Uh, what is what does difference mean? What um, what operation does that call to mind? What's that? Difference means sub subtract subtraction. And quotient means now, now we get dividing. So the difference quotient is subtract and then divide. There's a formula for it, but you're not going to have to memorize it. When you get to calculus, you will. But for here, we're going to give you the difference quotient because we want you to be able to work with it more than memorize it. f of x plus h minus f of x, there's the difference part, all over h. There's the quotient part, the divide part. Again, in calculus, we're going to start using this a lot, and you'll have to memorize it. But for you guys, we're not going to memorize that yet. We'll give it to you anytime you need it. We're more concerned with you getting the algebra of it correct. So let's find the difference quotient. For f of x equals x squared. Find the difference quotient for f of x equals x squared. Okay, so there's three pieces here that I need to put together. F of x, we know. That's the easy part. H is just a letter, so that's an easy part. The, the trick to this is finding F of x plus H first and then plugging all the pieces in. So this goes back to, to Roman numeral 1. F of x plus H means plug in x plus H wherever x was. I didn't foil last time, or I did it in my head, so I'll show it this time, especially since there's two variables involved there. Don't want to risk messing that up. It's definitely not x squared plus h squared. It's more than that, so I'm going to write it out, x plus h times x plus h. So first, outside would be xh 
inside would be xh, and last would be h squared. So x squared plus 2xh plus h squared. Likely, hopefully even, some of you could go straight from x plus h squared to this statement, and that would be fine. Like, I don't need to show, I don't need you to show every single step. I need you to show the steps that keep you on the right track so you don't mess something up, and I need to see enough to convince me that you know what you're doing. Right? If, if you jump to the final answer on this problem, I would probably take off some points because there's no way to just jump to the answer on this. Like, I need to see some steps in between. All right, so now we know f of x plus h. We know f of x. h is just the letter h. So let's start plugging in the pieces. I'm going to try to color code this. So x squared plus 2xh plus h squared. Minus f of x f of x was, or is, x squared all over h. Basically, the difference quotient in pre-cal is an excuse to get you to do a lot of algebra. you got to do f of x plus h, then you got to plug it in here and clean it all up. Let's see, the x squareds would cancel, and then we'd have 2xh plus h squared all over h. A couple of options for the next step, depending on how much work you think you need to show. The big deal is make sure you divide both of those by h. So if you can jump to the answer, good. If you're not sure, then factor out the h. Then it's really easy to see where it cancels. And we're left with 2x plus h. So difference quotient is not hard. It's just there's a lot to it. You've got to find f of x plus h. Then you plug it all in and do a whole bunch of cleanup work. So this is just really good algebra practice. Um, and the reason we include it is because when you get to calculus, most of the students do fine on the calculus. Their problems happen in their algebra. And so we're trying to get that cleaned up so that when you get to calculus, you can worry about calculus and have a strong algebra skills so that when you get this, you'll be OK. Let's do one more difference quotient, and then we'll be done. Fine difference quotient, abbreviating difference quotient for f of x equals x squared plus 3x. So job one is to find f of x plus h. So I'm going to press pause on the video, and you can try to find f of x plus h, and then we'll see where we're at. So there's a starting point. Wherever x was, put in x plus h, and now you've got another couple minutes of work ahead of you to foil that out, distribute the three, collect all the like terms, and do the, do the cleanup work. So f of x plus h minus all of f of x. So this one got ugly because there were two terms, but I wanted to give an example with two terms to make sure we see that the minus sign goes to both of them. And then all of that over h. Uh, now there are some like terms that I can get rid of. What, what will cancel? What do you see that will go away for us? the x squared, and then minus x squared, if we distribute that minus sign. 
a 3x, and then that's a minus 3x because there's a minus out front. Here's the good news. For us in pre-cal, this doesn't hold for calculus, but for us in pre-cal, everything in the second piece should cancel out. So if, if, you're, if you still got something left from this, then you, you did something wrong. For us, for now, everything over here will cancel. In calculus, things get a little more complicated, but for us, everything over there will cancel. All right, so let's be careful with what we got left here. 2hx, h squared, 3h, all over h. Last time I factored out the h, this time I'm thinking, wait a minute, as long as each thing has an h in it, I can just reduce you know, by the one h. So if, you, if it helps to factor it out, go for it. If you can just kind of visually see that I'm going to remove an h from each of those, then I would get 2x plus h plus 3. So that's the difference quotient for, goodness, where was it? x squared plus 3x. So kind of a pain, not really hard, just a algebra. You know, can you make it through without messing up any of the 14 algebra steps along the way? All right, today's assignment is worksheet one. I will post answers. They're not posted yet. Wait, are they posted yet? I don't think they're posted yet. They're close to being posted. Um, again, you start looking through, you're like, oh my gosh, this is terrible. But no, worksheet one is um, two pages front and back. Some of them are multiple choice and spaced out. Some of them are vertical line tests, so it's not really even that hard. So, you know, don't be overwhelmed. This isn't uh, too big of a deal. What I did want to say, one more thing, is four through nine... This relates to what we did yesterday, and I don't know that we did one quite like this. So determine whether the equation is a function or not based on the equation. The easiest way to do this is um, solve for y, and then you'll know. Like That's the only step to do, really, is solve for y. Uh, so let's look at number seven. We'll do number seven together. So if I want to solve that for y, y squared equals four minus x squared. And then what would I do to get y by itself? Okay, and here's the key thing, square root. What do you have to do when you put the square roots on a plus or minus? If you put the square roots on, you have to remember to put a plus or minus on there. Now think about what a function is. A function is for one value of x, you get one value of y. If you plug in the next value, you only get one answer. How many answers am I going to get for this? Two. Two. So is this a function? No. no. So if you have to square root, it's not going to be a function. If you put the square roots on, it's not going to be a function. Yeah. On number 8, the square root's already there, and there's not a plus or minus on it. So that one is, and oh, it's not 4 minus x, though. But that one is a function. You're only going to get one answer. You can't square root the pieces. But there's only one answer, because there's not a plus or minus in front of that. So even though it's a square root, it's a function. And the difference would be, this one would be, uh, it would be the, the top half of a circle. This number 7 would be the full circle. And so that kind of helps it square with vertical line test, pass, vertical line test, fail. So even easier than that, back up one step, because you're right, the shortcut is, well, if I have to put a square root on it, then it's not going to work. So even easier than that, what would make you have to put a square root on it? Y if y is squared. If there's a y squared in it, then eventually, this is kind of the shortcut to the whole section here, this little section anyway, if there's a y squared, I don't really need to solve all that, move things around, 
like eventually I'm gonna have to put plus or minus square root of something on there so I don't even really need to do all the algebra at some point I'm gonna hit this step and when I hit that step function or no yeah. no so I really don't have to do all the algebra for 4 through 9 it's just is there a y squared because if there is that's a problem later if there's not then it'll work so that's it it looks like a hard section but if you know the trick it's an easy section especially since we did half of it already all right again I will post answers I usually post answers and I usually post all the answers in Schoology um, and that means you have access to them but like you're <laughs> If all you do is copy my answers, like you're not learning anything. So I don't mind putting them out there because if that's all you're going to do, like that's going to show up on the test. So my hope is that you try them, then you pull up the answers and you're like, yep, 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 got them all right. Or whoops, I missed number five. Let me see if I can figure out how I missed number five. Or you probably won't miss number five, but you get what I'm saying. So I don't mind posting all the answers and I just trust that you'll use them the way you're supposed to use them. Um, and I post them with work shown. And so acceptable use is even, man, I don't understand number 11. Let me look at Mr. Wolf's answers and see if I can make sense of it. That's not cheating. That's using the resources I'm giving you. So in just a minute, I will post the answers to this worksheet. Um, and again, my hope is you do them all and then check them and you're good. But if you need to use it to help kind of teach yourself, that's okay as well. The only unacceptable use is just, you know, straight copying down what I wrote and handing that in. Could you get away with it? Probably, except that when you take the test, it'll become pretty apparent if you haven't done anything or if that's all you did.